Okay, I'm going to try to wake you up a little bit. We're at the very end of the conference, so both myself and Tom are going to give you some ideas that you can go think about and perhaps I'll be a bit entrepreneurial. In fact, I've been trying to do that for the IEEE over the past five years in which we have created a series of things that I'll get into more detail in just a moment that we're trying to spur interest all across the IEEE to go and help us formalize the future of the IEEE. So with that, let's get started. This is a pitch that I give to a lot of audience. So you know we're the world's biggest professional association with the biggest network of people all over the world. And I hope you're leveraging that network as you do your job or you plan your next job. Make use of the network. And uh, the IEEE has one core purpose and I believe it fits all of us. And the core purpose is to foster technological innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity. And to that end, five years ago, as I mentioned, the IEEE began developing ideas for the future. And ideas are great, but you've got to do something with those ideas. So around these different ideas, we formed a core project team that could execute something that we characterize and call an initiative. The very first initiative that came out of the pipeline was the IEEE Smart Grid, followed by a, a bio life science initiative, followed by cloud computing. Uh, the one I championed was um, and chaired was transportation electrification that we're going to talk about a bit more in the next 40 minutes. And I'm currently very deeply involved in the um, IEEE Internet of Things initiative. And if you think about it for just a moment, all of these initiatives have one common thread. There are things that connect industries, connect people, connect uh, where we live, uh, and also certainly economies. And one I forgot to mention was the IEEE Smart Cities initiative. Again, connectivity is all through this. So. Uh, and I repeat, I chair the Transportation Electrification Initiative. I bet you didn't know we were in electrified transportation. Well, really weren't. Four years ago, when I began to, to chair it, what we did was we looked at IEEE Explore, did a quick query to see how many electric vehicle related papers had been published and stored away as IP in our library. It was over 60,000 papers, and we didn't have any one core society that represented electric vehicles. Meanwhile, our competition organizations such as uh, ITS uh, America and ITS other countries, uh, SAE International, TU, uh, TRB, excuse me, uh, they were marching forward telling the world that they represented electric vehicles, and we were just so a big society with a lot of people that kind of published a paper here and there. So the Transportation Electrification Initiative formalized the way in which we could all work together. And on, by the way, on a side note, which society represents uh, more electric vehicles than another? Well, that was kind of hard to pin down. We did a quick exercise. We, we drew a big picture of a car or truck. and. We are treating transportation as transportation. It's not just cars, it's not just trucks, it's not just ships and airplanes, it's anything that moves and carries people and cargo. We tried to figure out how many IEEE societies uh, each provided from their technology silo uh, a bit or a piece of what it takes to build an electric vehicle. Uh, the exercise said 19 different societies. I had a lot of fun keeping those 19 societies together, but through it, we're no better known around the world than uh, we were four years ago. We've got societies that do uh, real-time networks, software, uh, real-time computing, energy storage, highly efficient uh, electric motors, power electronics, and a lot more up to the number 19. And with that, we have a... Uh, the ability to take on the world of other organizations and, and groups that each say, I represent transportation electrification. 
bottom line, we're trying to drive the transformation for uh, clean, efficient, connected, and safe vehicles. You know, that's sort of like a mission statement where you get 20 people into a room and you try to say as much as you can in just a handful of words. That's our statement. We're trying to cover the breadth and depth of transportation as it becomes more electric, more automated, more autonomous, and we try to keep it safe at the same time. It's multimodal support, a variety of things. And at its core, what we're creating is a forum, an easy, very carefully designed way in which I can connect to you, you can connect to me, and we can all connect together, share ideas, information, and move the world of transportation forward. And through it, we're creating, on one hand, a traditional platform of conferences and magazines and journals and workshops and such, but on the other side, we can move fast. You know, to do a conference takes a year. Well, what you're trying to do a conference about, as you start a year early, the topic may not be so, to so hot, if you will, a year later. So fast pace, comprehensive, and a way to work on things with a lot of people together. Uh, you see this puzzle that, by the way, fits together. You see some of the things that we've done to bring together uh, electrified transportation, uh, with standards being one of the core corners of this organization that we have built, and it has transitioned into an ongoing part at the end of the initiative. Here's our challenge. That little red gas can on the left-hand side of the screen is remarkable. It's low cost. In fact, it's getting cheaper right now by the day. It has a high energy content. It's very easy to transport. And, you know, it's something that you trust your grandmother to be able to handle and fuel her car when she needs additional gasoline. It's just about the perfect energy source, and I know someone's going to say, but it pollutes, Lee. Yeah, it pollutes. But other than that, it's perfect. But what if we come up with the idea of storing energy for propulsion another way? And uh, I had a friend helping with these slides. These slides are pretty accurate in terms of size and proportion and weight. Uh, it would take 21 lithium ion batteries of about that size relative to that one gallon of gas to equal the same energy content. Jeez, that's an awful lot to carry, makes your vehicle a bit inefficient from the get-go, as they say. In terms of weight, we're talking 340 kilograms to 2.7. If we can beat this challenge of energy density and add that to already very efficient motors and power electronics, the uh, issue and the question of whether I buy gas or electric next time I need a vehicle, uh, to be simple, we'll go with electric because it does fit all the needs we have. Okay. For just a few minutes, let's build the perfect uh, energy system, and then we'll say and look at how it does affect and support a growing business called consumer electronics. High energy density. Uh, to compete with gasoline, you need the ability to go 300 miles without refueling. A lot of folks say they have range anxiety. Well. There's anxiety with the tank of gas as well, and they accept the fact that about every 275 to 300 miles, you have to refill the tank. The advantage is it takes less than 10 minutes. It's got to be reliable. It's got to be safe. Uh, it's got to have a cost comparable to liquid fuels, whether it's uh, compressed natural gas or uh, gasoline a long life and a fast charge, and by long life, it means you should be able to cycle that battery upwards of uh, 2,500 to 3,000 times, uh, or more. 
Uh, batteries that recycle with a low impact to the environment, and the hopes right now is we'll take batteries that are in current cars and certainly the next generation of, of batteries uh, where we can tweak the packaging a bit more. Uh, batteries will give you a life in your car and then transition into a grid level storage for the utilities and others that have to store renewable energy during the second half of the day. And bi-directional energy flow. In this perfect world, uh, we'd like to be able to charge the battery and also provide energy back to the grid from that battery when the grid needs it. Transportation of the future. Again, clean, efficient, connected, and safe. And this diagram pretty much illustrates the various things that will be connected to the vehicle in the not too distant future. Where is the IEEE at? I can't tell you how many times I've heard of the past few years that the SAE beat you to the charging connector. Yeah, we were asleep at that moment and let another group beat us. But in the reality, we're the bigger picture. If you look at the big picture, we can take care of all, all the rest of the power to generate, transmit it, distribute it, get it to the vehicle, and then right down at the vehicle socket is where SAE comes in. So we're co we have covered the rest of the energy picture very nicely. We're working on uh, telematics and uh, connected vehicle standards right now, so we will very much fill up the rest of the screen with IEEE standards that will benefit IEEE members and the rest of the IEEE that want to be involved in electric transportation. We can't do it by ourselves. One of the, the things I'm most proud of while I was doing the initiative is we reached out to the rest of the world and said, we need your help. And that outreach went to, well, the 19 societies and more within the IEEE, which is oftentimes a little unheard of. We do work in our silos. We reached out to other professional organizations that each had a piece at the big table of uh, transportation. We reached out to companies. We asked them what they needed, how we could help them. Could we put together training or publications or things that would benefit, benefit their employees? And lastly, the world of the university. So. This is a snapshot of last year. We worked with more since. And our challenge is to keep the communications going because, well, it's the right thing to do. And secondly, this is a network we're building beyond the IEEE that we're going to make it available to our membership. Industry scope. At the core of this diagram, you see the traditional automotive companies, Audi, Ford, GM, BMW, Mercedes, the people we've known to trust and appreciate what they've done. But around the bigger diagram, you see a lot of companies that, well, did not exist three years ago. So you see that the transportation marketplace that we thought was sort of old and most have become old fuddy-duddies, uh, has become very entrepreneurial. These little companies with bright ideas that can move very fast, they're overshadowing the traditional manufacturers and making sure that they move fast. So if you've got an idea and you want to become a part of this growing world of transportation, these folks did it. You can do it too. All right, a quick final refresher on the initiative, and then we'll get into some fun stuff. Uh, we have conferences, publications, education, standards, communications, and a test bed. Uh, I think we're on, um, no one else can do what we're doing in our traditional space, and some further things that we've done to it to make sure that we're relevant and can catch the attention of people that want to learn about electronic and electric transportation. Publications, if you want to know what we know so in, in a way that we can provide it back to you, but we've got the traditional web portal, email, a range of social media, conferences, pubs. We publish and we talk to a lot of people. Please make use of it. Our next big conference is coming up in October in Shenzhen, China. This is one of two major conferences that um, 
represent what we're doing. The other conference is uh, ITEC, and it's being held in multiple countries around the world. It is our core foundation conference for electric vehicles. And this one is called ICCVE, and it's all about connected vehicles. So that little red car you saw a moment ago, its ability to connect to the rest of the world, meaning the cloud, the vehicles in front and behind, and down to the intelligent roadbed, is through the technology and things and the people that you'll see at this conference. We expect about 1,500 people at this conference. Okay, communication is important. Uh, the website. A new channel we've got is one called Flipboard, and we update it every single day. So you, if you want to know what happened yesterday in the world of electric and connected transportation, it's right here on Flipboard. We have almost 6,000 articles there, so you could use it for a library of what's happened over the past few years, and it's always pulled from relevant uh, uh, popular communication magazines and journals such that if you want to find out who's the hot person to talk to at one of those companies in that big diagram, it's in this channel. And it goes back a few years. You can't just send email and do things with the rest of the world. You've got to get out and meet the right people. So the gentleman in the middle, his name is Alejandro. What is his claim to fame? Does anybody recognize him? He's the person who started Formula E. I know in a European setting, you all know about Formula One, but Formula E is the electric vehicle equivalent to the gas-driven uh, electric car series. In his first year, last year, he held a race, uh, 10 of them, countries all over the planet. He's getting a lot of visibility, not only for what he started, but the technology platform that is built on that can impact and support careers all over this room. Now, the gentleman over on the right side, his name is Tony Poskowitz. And uh, his claim to fame is he headed the team that designed and built the very first Chevy Volt. So uh, it was quite an honor to meet both these gentlemen, and we're now connected. Conferences and conferences. We don't do it in just two. We have a family. And we have a test bed that we've been involved in, in designing this being built in Greenville, South Carolina, on a, uh, a very large piece of property owned by Clemson University and their International Center for Automotive Research. So if you're in South Carolina, let me know. I'll get you a tour and you can see the progress they're making to test out all this electronic systems, hardware, software, and consumer electronics. All right, where did it all begin? It began back in 1922 with a radio designed and built by Chevrolet. No, this is not that one. The one that they designed was a monster. It, it pretty much occupied uh, the backside of the vehicle just so it could be a radio. So it took a decade or two, and a company called Motorola, there it is, designed a a radio that was not only small, it was reliable. Think about it. A car can get very cold, it can get very hot. Uh, I know mine, it shakes and bumps a lot all over the rough roads in the southeast, and um, it set off an industry. Think of how many radios have been built based on the lessons learned of the original Motorola car radio. So what can we do with technology and consumer electronics? Well, that's next. Land Rover, brand new article yesterday, has devised systems that can see around corners, like the tractor trailer truck in, the, in, the, in front of it, or see things behind it, and certainly see through you know, fog and other things that Volvo has become famous for. So uh, uh, you can see the impossible with today's consumer electronics. You can have fun with it. Here's an electric skateboard. Now, you may say that's trivial, but it'll go 10 miles. It's like a Segway. When you step off of it, it doesn't flip over on the side. It stabilizes and waits for you. 
You couldn't do this five years ago, and it's a quick means to go somewhere across the city through your uh, uh, area where you live. It's a neat trick, and the technology that this is built on will spawn other products. I hope you're listening. Cheap, dependable, short-range electric vehicle. Here's one thing you can do with it. You can cover a city with the same kind of technology. Electric wireless controls for a bicycle. Uh, city of LA is trying to get people out of cars and onto bicycles. They see that as a, uh, a solution to all the traffic in, in LA. Well, if you make the uh, bicycle more reliable, certainly safer, and a few other things, uh, it might just work. Now, it doesn't compensate for the 60 mile commutes that a lot of LA people do, but it's a start. Somebody's going to build on this. The consumer electronics aftermarket. <coughs> a lot of folks like to go to the uh, auto store and buy, you know, different kinds of, of chrome just to you know, dress up the cars. You can also buy electronics. This particular item, uh, the little box on the left hand side, plugs into the diagnostic port that is standard on vehicles from around the world. And through that port, uh, you can receive information about what the car is doing or not doing very well. It's controlled by your, your smartphone and it opens the door to a lot of things that you can do with an older car. Great example of the growing aftermarket that is becoming electronic. One of the things that happens with all this fun of putting electronics and transportation is you end up with display clutter. Uh, typical modern day car has got two, sometimes three electronic screens on the dashboard. Which one do you look at? Does it interfere with driving? And also brings up a, a comment about that first uh, uh, radio for the car. A number of governments around the country and internationally try to legislate the radio out of the car because they saw it as distracting. Wow. How far have we come, come since then? There's bad side effects. The, the world thought they had a standard for your electronic key to get in and out of your car. Well, those 25 automakers that were using that standard woke up one morning to find out that they had been hacked. They're working on the next generation now. Volkswagen, what have they, have they done? Just for fun and also to uh, exploit some new ideas they had, they built a baby coaster that will follow you. He's got, he has a transponder in his pocket, and where he goes, the baby stroller goes. Well, it's, as it turns out, it took some fairly complicated control theory and other things to make the stroller follow the dad, uh, and it's going to start showing up in Volkswagens in the years to come. It, who knows, it may be a, a product that you can buy. Uh, if you go to that address, and I'll, I can give it to you offline, uh, it's pretty neat what they've done. What if someone hacks your baby carriage? Yes, yes. Aftermarket again. Here's an example of what you can do all on your own workbench to add to a car. And this little company uh, has a marketplace that covers the world for this little device that he can put on your dashboard. It's not going to damage anything. It plugs into that diagnostic port under the dash and gives you right in front of you in a, I think, a, a controlled manner. It's not all over the screen like some of the dis display clutter. It tells you things about your car. It plugs into a GPS and, and aids uh, you in your travels. And uh, I wish I thought of it. The market for this is going to be, can you say, immense? What do you say? 
Does it also work when the driver sits on the left side? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure to be. You can move it from one side to the other. Okay. There's a war going on out there. A battle between two companies that you never thought could tell those companies in the middle of that big company diagram to, to do this or do that. Apple and Google. Who ever thought they could affect BMW, and Mercedes, Ford, GM? But somehow they have given the world uh, the, um, the position that they will decide who's going to control the electronic dashboard of today and especially the future. So they're trying to gather up uh, the functions that normally go through and on a dashboard, provide connectivity to your smartphone and other things coming up. And uh, the typical car, especially this coming year, uh, will not have a Honda dashboard or a BMW dashboard. This could be one of the Apple or, or Google dashboards, whether we like it or not. Future cars and transport will mean radical interior designs. Look at this couple on the left-hand side. All they've got is screens and toys to play with. Well, uh, the automakers think that's what we want. I've got a few statistics in a moment that will say otherwise. Here's a Mercedes picture on the right-hand side. They want to turn your car into a conference room. The seats turn around, screens pop up. You can't really see it, but there's a screen on the inside of the door on one side. I don't want to do this while I'm riding around. I want to drive a car. BMW's got it right, the ultimate driving machine. Cars are for fun and getting to work. Ah. The Aston Martin DB10 is coming up. In another month or so, you can go see the brand new James Bond movie. You can see James here in the middle of the screen. He likes it a lot. And uh, we'll have to wait until late November to find out what degree of consumer electronics are going to be in this car. Tom Coughlin has one on order already. But, uh, you know, you think this is fun, but, you know, movies five, ten years ago, who would have thought we would have multiple screens in our cars in the cars or in the movies back then? So this might set the standard and ideas for the next level of consumer electronics. I like this one. Electronic maps, GPSs, they belong in cars. Uh, it helps my wife and I get to where we want to go, and I'm, I'm sure you've got one in your car, too. And right now, the German car industry is buying Nokia's here map system. It's available and uh, world-class in terms of a you know, GPS-driven map system. Here's something else you can add to your bicycle. If we're going to be driving and riding bicycles, I guess you might as well have consumer electronics to uh, keep you out of trouble and keep you safe. Now, all joking aside, uh, my daughter's husband is a big-time bicyclist. He, he'll go for 150 miles on a Saturday. But one morning a couple of months ago, he got hit while he was driving the bike by a school bus. So... Uh, He's thinking about the proper instrumentation to go on his bicycle to protect him from not only cars, but giant school buses that slipped up on him. Why new cars are crammed with too many dumb gizmos. I'll tell you one reason why. Uh, it's hard for the automakers, any of them, to make a profit on glass and steel. Their profit is on gizmos. As they sell you a new car, the, the, the few dollars you make on the average car is through electronics and consumer electronics. They think they've got us figured out. They know what we think we, we won't. You've all probably seen the Google kind of bubble car, the, the forerunner of, of autonomous vehicles. Uh, I don't want to knock Google, but a lot of their ideas never go to market. But uh, Mr. Elon Musk at Tesla, he's got a pretty good track record. He, uh, he's rolling out 
the pieces of the autonomous vehicle right now. Uh, do we want to drive an autonomous vehicle? I don't want one. I think Volvo's got it right. They call their cars the automated vehicle. They put a little bit of smarts in the car to help you look out for other cars, and especially uh, the deer in the darkness ahead of you, and also help you, uh, you know, automatically park your car. I can take that bit of, uh, of, of electronics and consumer electronics, but sitting back and having a meeting while the car is uh, going somewhere, that's a bit much for me. But it's a lot of profit for the uh, automotive manufacturers. Connected car fail. Consumers are ignoring much auto technology. And this is already dividing into two categories right now. In the U.S., with this Department of Transportation, April of last year, they mandated that uh, vehicles will talk to each other by 2017, early 2018. Uh, and by talking, uh, they hope to eliminate collisions, save lives, uh, and also have the ability to uh, uh, provide better fleet management uh, uh, and save a lot of uh, energy it's taking for the propulsion. I get that. Plus, I have no choice. It'll be in the next car I buy. Uh, but a lot of this other stuff, uh, the consumers aren't very hot to the idea yet. For example, the top tech consumers don't want on their vehicle, and let's see if you agree with these statistics. Rear seat entertainment, 58% say, I don't want that. Massaging seats, well, Tom might like that. 47% say, no, no, not in my car. In vehicle uh, services, I'm not quite sure what that means, but 44% of us don't want it. Automatic parking system. I just said I like the idea of your car parking in a parallel parking slot, but 39% say, I don't need it. Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Uh, that's a significant statistic there that say, I don't want uh, those two companies to provide the technology for my electronic dashboard. Okay, the other half of the question, well, what do we do want to buy on our next vehicle? Blind spot warning, warning and detection. That example from uh, Land Rover you saw at the very beginning of this. 87% need help in looking for that car around the corner or that kid or deer around the corner. Fuel economy indicator. Uh, my wife has a new a Honda Fit, and it tells her constantly how she's doing with her foot on the gas. Uh, and she's learned to, uh, it's like an electronic game. She, she's better now at pushing on the gas pedal and not making the number go up as high as it did when she first bought it. What difference does it make? Uh, she's saving about a tank of gas a week because she's learned how to play the game with the gas pedal. Seat lumbar adjustment, 86% say, I gotta have it. I guess that's for us aging backs. I can relate to that. A phone pairing system, 84%. That little Honda fit of my wife's as the car uh, sees electronically the Bluetooth coming from the phone, they're in sync. So now when she drives down the road, if I call her, it's through the dashboard. She doesn't have to fumble around and take her eye off the road to take a call from me. And the parking assist, I believe that means finding your car in the parking lot. 82% of us want that feature. And these numbers are brand new. They came out of a, uh, you see the address, Fortune magazine on August 25th. So, for the people in this room, and I wish we had a few more, we're going to stay in sync with what we know, who we know, and what we think is going to be the next big idea. We will continuously put it out through our, the information that is, uh, through our, our web portal, and across the top you see uh, a goodly choice of sub-categories of information. Please make use of them. And unlike the traditional IEEE website, it changes a lot.
And with that, I'll take your questions. Speak up. Uh, use your father or mother voice. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you. What? Any question? Any question? There's one over there. Please use the mic. Well, thank you for your talk. Um, at the beginning, you were talking about this gas and battery stuff. And I was wondering, um, is there any future perspective of using um, fuel cells and hydrogen as a energy source in between? Because that you can fill in 10 minutes. Oh, it's, it's great station. competition. It's going to make... Uh, other companies beyond Elon Musk build electric battery factories and also keep the technology going faster down both roads, if you will, had there just been one source of energy, the battery. Uh, you know, a lot of discussion, especially in, in the UK right now, around electrifying roads. Uh, uh, Volvo and Siemens have a demonstration road here in Germany where tractor trailers will get their energy not from the road but, but overhead. And that technology is very reliable. You see it in, in cities all over Europe. So what you know now won't be true in two years. There's a lot of competition pushing things forward and fuel sources such as hydrogen, uh, such as uh, ongoing, they, they call it dynamic wireless charging from the roadbed or above. Uh, batteries becoming more energy dense. Good example, the original Tesla Roadster. Well, you got to start somewhere. Technically speaking, it was a stinker. But Elon Musk is now offering upgrades at an attractive price to make the original Roadster smarter and certainly have a greater range. What other car manufacturer in the world five years later will go back and upgrade something they sold you years ago? Nobody. So again, Tesla and Elon Musk is just you know revolutionizing the, um, the industry. And he's not standing still. He's going to make average pack of batteries for a car, an electric car, is $18,000. That's a pretty good premium. He's going to get it down much lower within just a couple of years. And that will just make the uh, electric vehicle market just explode uh, exponentially. Of course, government and other things will also affect that. You've got cities like London and Paris saying, effective some date in the future, but not too far in the future, you won't be able to drive a gas or a diesel vehicle in the city. Too much pollution. Uh, so we should have this conversation again here in Berlin in three or four years and just compare the slide sets to say what has changed. You know, change has been real slow in the electronic market. I'll give you one example. Uh, black and white TVs. There was a RCA, if you remember the brand, television chassis that basically didn't change for 25 years. So what the manufacturers did year after year to entice you to buy another TV is they became experts in furniture. Your television set had this awesome, you know, furniture box around it that not only convinced the, the man to buy the TV, but also the wife who had to position it somewhere in the, in the living room. So electric vehicles, there is no set future for fuel. Chairman of BMW was asked two years ago, what fuel would drive all of his vehicles in 25 years? And he said, I don't know. But uh, since then, BMW is saying that uh, everything is going to at least be electric. Where that electric energy will come from, that's going to be the challenge that engineers all across this room can be a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Lee, I have uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, we did discuss the other day briefly and touched on it, cybersecurity, and I think you did alert in some of your questions. A um, lot of work being done in that area and would like you to just probably comment on that if you could. Oh. The other one is uh, also a um, set of interest is spin-offs into other areas like battery technologies for cars has potential spin-offs into residential um, you know, independence you know, um, 
uh, off the, you know, and being off the grid and stuff like that. So the um, transportation industry is generating a lot of technology um, that has potential for spin-offs in other areas. So they're the two points, if you could comment on those, yeah. thanks. Uh, cyber security, big, big problem. You saw the example I had around the, the wireless key. Uh, there are hackers right now that have discovered how to drive next to a vehicle and tell the vehicle to either go fast or turn off. Uh, and as the cars get a bit more uh, uh, autonomous, in, in other words, have servos that control the tires going left or right, there's the risk of that kind of uh, takeover. But um, the, the technology is not standing still. Uh, transportation has had a, a, a early wake-up call with respect to cybersecurity, and I think they'll fix their cyber problems faster than the rest of the world because uh, it's a life safety issue. Uh, uh, if one of your vehicles allows someone to die because the kid next door hacked uh, the vehicle wirelessly, uh, that company has a lot to lose. They could even potentially lose their company uh, if a class action suit was applied against them. So. Uh, They'll fix it before government fixes their problem, and I think they'll fix it before any other industry. Uh, you know, what's the incentive to fix cybersecurity on an iPhone? But for vehicles with people inside, big time. So, uh, next question. Uh, Ali? <clears throat> Please use the mic. Uh, get your take on it if you have an opinion because one conversation at least is going on in Silicon Valley is that uh, companies like Apple and Google already have made electric cars alike or perhaps next generation of what Tesla has and their barrier the significant challenge that they have is really the existing uh, automotive infrastructure automotive companies that are lobbying that are sort of uh, grudgingly uh, not wanting to make to have this transition happen I mean if you add up the market cap of uh, the traditional automotive companies, it could add up to multiples of trillions of dollars. And it's not like these factories and these investments that have been made can just automatically, over a short period of time, make a transition from uh, you know, traditional fuel-based automotive to, to electric cars. And a lot gets eliminated, right? Pistons and sure. the brakes and the, the fuel injection system. I mean, and it's, so it's not just the automotive companies, the distributors, all the folks that make the components. I mean, a lot is going to be destructed when this thing takes off. And uh, uh, Google and Apple, uh, even Facebook, some people are suggesting it's going to get in the market. These are a bunch of young people that really don't care about profits. They just want to make things happen. So again, I think the, the, yeah. the conversation is sort of operating at a different level, that the issue is not the technology. They have the technology. They have everything they need to make this thing take off. But there's so much resistance and so much lobbying uh, that it just is because there's so much at stake. I don't know if you have any, any there's, insight there's on that. There's a number of articles you can Google and see where, uh, and I've got some of them on the Flipboard channel for transportation. Uh, Silicon Valley has become not only the place for products such as operating systems and emails and, and, and toys, they've got, they've become the serious design center for the entire world uh, of automotive, transportation, and certainly uh, the consumer electronics for that industry. Um, BMW's there, Mercedes is there, all the American companies are there, and it, it drives innovation because they're up and down the same street. Uh, people kind of, you know, move from one to the other to pick up the next raise, but all that networking is making what you've just seen go faster and faster, and they're doing quality work. And most of them, well, I just, well I'll say many of them are, are, are young folks who don't mind working 80 hours a week. Uh, I don't think they work 80 hour weeks in Detroit much anymore. And uh, it's, it's changed the dynamics of the entire industry. That's why you see so many startups on that great big diagram. So like the BMW CEO, uh, there's a lot of questions that he and similar CEOs are going to say, I don't know what's going to be the, you know, the functionality or the standards for um, uh, the future of transportation. Now, for the IEEE to be relevant, we've got to provide education, uh, conferences, and standards uh, that 
uh, these automotive companies need their engineers to go to to get to understand fundamentals on one hand and also interesting new niche technology that uh, uh, the academic world and, and developers uh, in the world have come up with. So and then the, the, the folks in the Silicon Valley can mix and match that to create things that, well, we never thought of that before, but we never had the technology either. So it's a great world coming up in terms of products, consumer electronics, but um, the IEEE has got to be relevant. And one way and one, one place that we've got to be relevant is in standards. Uh, Standards take forever to come out of the IEEE standards pipeline. These folks invent things overnight. And if we can't give it an official standard and a standard number that's relevant to the world, somebody else will. We might be left in the dust, as they say, if we don't have our standards process updated so we can keep up with technology. Thank you very much, uh, Lee. Uh, we should uh, cut uh, to continue running the, the program uh, after the, the session ends. Uh, if somebody wants, uh, can uh, go I'll and, be and here. discuss with, with Lee. Thank you very much, Lee. Okay. All right, Tom, I got them warmed up for you. <laughs>